So uh, welcome everyone uh, for our session about uh, text to use detection, um, and we, which is a significant uh, turn uh, to which we found ourselves uh, walking in the last uh, two years. And uh, I am very happy to open this session. Uh, unfortunately, we have a slight change in the plan uh, Hadar Miller was not able to participate today, and I will present instead a kind of an overview about what we've done so far uh, in the field of uh, text to use, and will explain uh, the directions Hadar is intending to take. Um, we will have uh, three presentations, and then the response by Marco Buffler. And um, uh, our, our first speaker is uh, Uri Shaw. Uri um, has both um, a, um, um, both degrees in both computer science and Talmud, and is and uh, he joined us and was a member of the team of the Sofrim project, and uh, now. He back to his work in the industry, he's still working with us uh, on his spare time on some of our research projects. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and uh, Uri is the developer of Rufus, of which you will hear very soon. And he will uh, present now Rufus, text news detection for mapping rabbinic manuscripts, please. I'll just share my uh, screen first. Tell me if you all, if you can all see the first slide in the presentation. It says Rufus, great. Thank you, Moshe. I also like working with you, <laughs> so uh, we're even. Um, actually, Rufus was already presented by Moshe Verd and myself uh, at DH Jewish earlier this year. Um, so I don't want to, um, I don't know how many people were there. Um, so this will be kind of a recap, not too long. So I won't bore the ones who were I'm talking to you, Sinai. Um, but uh, uh, enough so everyone understand what Rufus is about. And um, it's a text uh, reuse detection algorithm. Um, actually can be referred to uh, more as a method and it's better for this time of day here in Israel where algorithm is uh, a bit too much to talk about um, and it's a statistical classification method which scales well well uh, with the search corpus the target library so we can work very well with where the target library is very uh, large and it can overcome variance between significant variance between the input text, the text that you're that you have in at, in hand that you're looking uh, for match for parallels and the target matches within uh, within the corpus. Uh, we've developed Rufus um, initially to identify or to classify if there is no clear identification of maltranscribed Geniza fragments. These are very uh, bad texts, um, and they, they're both uh, partial, fragmentary, and uh, because the, um, the quality, the low quality of the transcription, uh, they, they had many uh, other errors. Uh, later on, when we worked uh, on book-long texts in the Tikkun Safrim projects, the artifacts of the HDR of uh, full uh, Tanhuma manuscripts we adapted Rufus algorithm to, um, to segment and align um, the, the long text into paragraphs um, in, the, uh, um, in the, the search, uh, in the target library, in the search corpus. Um, so the best way to, this, to, uh, to explain how Rufus works is by uh, demonstrating it on a short uh, example. And this is an actual line taken from the uh, HDR, the handwritten, handwritten text recognition 
um, of Parma 3122 manuscript. Um, and you can see, uh, the ones of you who read the Hebrew, that um, um, as an HTR text, it also has uh, errors. But um, on top of that, um, the, the, this manuscript is different in many ways from the print editions, uh, from the, the documents uh, that we're searching parallels in. Um, so this is an example of a mistake of the HDR. It's actually a biblical uh, quote, Hanoch uh, al Pidolko, very partial biblical quote. And we also try to identify these, the, um, the quotes. Uh, so how does it work? Um, first, we uh, we take we've taken the, the library and we've used Safari Project, which uh, makes available um, rabbinical texts in a very friend, friendly license, Creative Commons license, uh, already dis dissected into uh, passages. So it's it's very easy to use it as an input source for such a uh, such a use. Um, and the uh, the passages are uh, the hierarchy is the traditional hierarchy. So we're talking um, Mishnah or Babylonian uh, Babylonian Talmud uh, page according to the uh, traditional hierarchy. And then uh, what Rufus does is it iterates the text from beginning to end, working on engrams on window of words. In this case, three words, and for each such engram. It searches the target uh, library, which was indexed in a full text search engine for matching documents. So the first engram, the th first three words will result in a list of documents from which we take the top two. And then it goes over and slides the window. Um, as you can see, if you're quick enough, the windows overlap. So it slides one word at a time. So there's an overlap. And once it completes, exhausts the, uh, the full text, then it aggregates the results and sorts them. And hopefully the best scored uh, documents in the target library in the corpus will be the ones that actually match uh, the input text. So this is what, um, uh, what the uh, beta GUI graphical user interface looks like. Um, it's a really miniature website. Um, let me just run, run an example for a second. Um, and uh, since, since it's running on a free level, free tier, whatever uh, server, it's not that performant, but still, I wouldn't run it on long text, but this is a line from um, two lines from another Tanhuma, um, Tanhuma manuscript, Geneva 146. And as you can see, the result um, gave me Tanhuma Re'e uh, in the first one, uh, one res uh, version of the recension of the Tanhuma as the first uh, score. The other one, Tanhuma Buber, got much lower uh, score. The score here is the rate, the ratio between the engrams that were found as a hit in the, in the matching document and the overall number of engrams of um, group of words in the text. And I, when going over the results, I can see uh, which engrams actually match the, the passage uh, below. Um, so it's really better because there's not, not much to it more than uh, the three parameters, which are the first one is the um, is the edit distance, the engram size, the number of uh, of words, uh, the size of the win the word uh, the word window that is rolled over the text. Uh, we found three three grams to be uh, the best uh, performing uh, engram size, um, but I'm sure that it will change will vary according to the um, to the characteristics of the text. And then there's the edit distance, the fuzziness. And this is uh, the number of characters that can uh, change either 
be added, deleted, or modified uh, within the search query, within the uh, engrams, uh, between the input text and the matching document in the search in the target corpus. And the, the last parameter is the word span. And that's the number, the maximal number of words um, that can be added between two adjacent words uh, in the search query in the engram or in the, in the target, uh, uh, the matching document in the target corpus. And that should overcome uh, larger changes such as abbreviations that are expanded or um, different phrasing um, or uh, in the case of fragmentary text, uh, deletions or omissions of words that, that were that are simply not there in the manuscript uh, and so on. So these are the three parameters that are um, available in the, uh, in the GUI, which is of course intended for uh, manual interactive usage. It doesn't handle long text. So the three modes uh, in which we use Rufus for now are the, the GUI that are presented for small units. Uh, we are running it offline on larger uh, book long texts. And uh, we use uh, visualizations that um, you'll see in Verid's uh, presentation soon. Um, when the data, <clears throat> when this is the best way to, to look into the data and see when, when a work uh, is used, when the text switches from one work to another. This is an example of, um, of the output in Excel. What we have is uh, we print out for now the first and second um, best uh, results per line. We go over the text line by line um, and uh, find the best the the, the, the best uh, uh, result on a window of for of fifteen uh, words. Uh, so there is some memory in the uh, uh, in the algorithm. Um, and you can see that we also try, we also look for um, biblical uh, quotations. So while we run over the text, we're running it against two indexes, uh, two search engine indexes. Uh, the first one would be of the, the Bible verses and the second one is of rabbinical uh, literature. Um, this slide actually is for the ones who were not attending uh, this presentation, so it recaps already was covered, hopefully. Um, so the last um, two slides are what we've come to, to learn are the strength and uh, the weaknesses, the shortcomings of, um, of Rufus. Um, and I'm sure we'll learn uh, more down, down the road, hopefully. Uh, the first one is more of an engineering I think strength. Um, it has a good, what we engineers call price performance ratio. Uh, it's very easy to set up uh, and yet it, it uh, sh shows uh, um, surprisingly good effect uh, performance. Um, so all you need is a search engine, which is an off-the-shelf open source software we're using Lucene. Uh, you can use um, Elasticsearch, which is basically Lucene. Um, and uh, the, the software involved is really uh, small. So the algorithm was, was, is really not, not something uh, uh, that's hard to, uh, to implement. Um, and uh, the, the the good thing is the, the, this method is corpus agnostic. So it's generic and it will work for uh, any, uh, any corpora uh, without the need for uh, tailoring NLP capabilities. So we've ran it, I mean, the, the, this uh, corpus that we used is a mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic, uh, but we, we, we didn't really attend to it. And it still worked uh, well because it's unaware of of uh, the language, uh, of the syntax of the, uh, uh, of the, of the other uh, features of the language. 
Um, and you can call it a brute force uh, algorithm. It, it is a brute force algorithm, um, but in a good way. The uh, unique features, the, the engrams that are more rare than the others, the ones that actually helps, uh, would help the, the researcher lock into uh, the matching uh, document, the matching passages, uh, actually rise above all the white noise that is generated by the, the more common features. Um, so we don't have to do, uh, we're not uh, trying to filter out the white noise, but rather let, uh, let this significant result rise above uh, the surface of the white noise. And uh, the, the parameters that, uh, that I've touched before, the fuzziness and the word span, which are uh, features of the, the Lucene search engine, uh, support both changes in, uh, inside the word uh, at character level, which can either uh, come from orthography variations or in our case, HDR or uh, transcription errors, but also from bigger, larger uh, variations um, that the word span will overcome. Um, this, these include literary uh, variations, phrasing, stylistic, um, different attributions, etc. And uh, the, we found the, found the parameterization uh, to be helpful in, a, in adapting to different uh, tasks. And the one that, that, uh, that we used already was different uh, word span, zero actually, for biblical, uh, uh, for, for exact uh, quotations uh, from the Bible. Um, and we've, we've tested different, um, different word windows um, until we found the one that seemed to work uh, for us. And it will probably differ for other cases. And um, it's not all good. Um, there's, we, we know that uh, the, the algorithm First, uh, it's uh, computationally cost, at least uh, uh, theoretically, uh, because um, for each uh, for each text, uh, it will generate uh, searches for uh, the the the, uh, the size of the text. So it's n uh, its its complexity is uh, is uh, linear with this, the length of the, the input text. Uh, the good news is that the, the performance of the full text search engine is so great because of the internet and us Googling stuff all the time that it only takes half an hour uh, on a single core to, uh, to segment and uh, align um, te the text that uh, Varied will soon talk about um, that holds, contains over 10,000 uh, lines. Um, the other, the other point I already touched a bit. It lacks the finesse or the, the sophistication of tailored algorithms, um, and in in that sense, it won't uh, handle translation. So, if if the uh, the input text contains a Hebrew translation of an Aramaic text, it will not find it. Um, and uh, the same goes for text that. Um, that, that use heavily uh, synonyms or abbreviations. And all of these can be mitigated, but this, this will be a heavy task to implement uh, by the implementation of Lucene anal analyzer, tokenizers, um, and filters. Uh, but again, this will be a much larger uh, task. And another um, another shortcoming that we've encountered uh, in the uh, in the manuscript that, that Verid will talk about is that the uh, the target corpus is flat, meaning that it's not hierarchical. So that if, for an example, it contains both primary texts such as uh, such as uh, Babylonian Talmud and the secondary text uh, such as commentary. Uh, on the Talmud that quotes, um, that has um, sizable quotations from the Talmud, 
then when searching this, when using this, uh, uh, when using this corpus for the uh, search engine index, you'll get funny results jumping from uh, from uh, the uh, the primary documents into the the secondary the, the later documents. Um, we've we've given some thought on how to uh, to work around this, but for now what we did was uh, to was creating different uh, different indexes for the uh, for different parts of the uh, of the corpus. Not an ideal solution, but uh, uh, this is what we did so so far. Um, so that concludes uh, my presentation, and we'll go to the questions uh, at the end, Moshe. Or uh, yes, yes. Thank you, very, thank you, Uri. We will uh, collect questions uh, in the end, and clearly, you can now. Um, Put questions if you have so on the chat, and uh, and and we will be able to respond uh, after um, Marco Bichlow's response to the three lectures that are presented in this session. So our second speaker is uh, uh, Vered Raziel Kretschmer, who is the Yuval Neiman postdoc fellow uh, leading the project of. Uh, um, of, of uh, mapping ontological manuscripts uh, through text use detection uh, uh, methods. Uh, Vered completed her PhD in uh, Ben Gurion University. She is an expert in liturgy and in the Jewish paleography, and especially in terms of the Geniza. Um, uh, um, fragments and their uniqueness. And, and she's working with us for many, many years, uh, first on our, in the Midrash project, and later on joined us uh, to the Digital Humanities Project in Tikkun Sofrim, and now uh, on, on this project. So uh, thank you very much for it, and the stage is yours. Unmute yourself. Very okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. And see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay, Rowling Window Fuzzy Search, nicknamed Rofus, whose specification were lovely presented by Uri, was initiated as a cataloging A tool as part of, of a pipeline aiming towards full accessibility of Jewish manuscripts. We aim towards a general tool of full text engine open code that could be adapted to any research area and text types by adjusting the index library. In this paper, I will present the initial results of the examination of the algorithm on two types of medieval Jewish Midrashic manuscripts. First, Tanchuma manuscripts, and then an unpublished anthological essay. Then I'll discuss the intermediate conclusions and the improvements we intend to make following these tests. Our first test case were two automatically produced texts of Tanchuma. The Tanchuma literature is a genre of late Midrash originated in the land of Israel. It evolved through a long period of creative transmission thus represented in many variants. Next to the two printed editions, Tanchuma Buber and the print editions, other recensions are extant in soil manuscripts. The various types of text we use found in Tanchuma variants made them a non-trivial trial for office. For our first test in the Rafus, we run it over two HDR Tanchuma manuscript, MS Geneva 146 and Parma 3122. Both were automatically transcribed through Escriptorium and used for our earlier project, Tikkun Sofrim. For MS Geneva, not only we had a moderately mal transcribed text, his character error rate is 8.9%, 
we had a corrected full text to compare with. We examined how effective is the tool in analyzing three levels of text, a whole manuscript, a large portion, such as a chapter or a homily, and on the finest level, a single line. One of our first observation was that Rofus could cope pretty well with the misspelling of the HDR text. Of course, the corrected text had produced better results with higher statistical significance. Still, we were generally able to identify most text reuse phenomena through the HDR text of, Mount, of Manuscript Geneva. The high fuzziness could often overcome the challenge of medium error rate. As for cataloging full manuscripts, MS Parma includes several works copied one after the other on the same codex. This visualization demonstrates the identification of these works. Here, for instance, we can see the transition point between the Tanchuma and Psikta. The chart brings forward other issues of large scale arrangements, such as the insertion of a large portion of Shira Shirim Rabba in the middle of Psikta Rabati. We can also notice the peak of Tanchuma materials in the middle of the Psikta. Here, these results do not point to an insertion of Tanchumaic section into the Psikta, rather to the similarity between these certain portions in both works. Actually, this anomaly serves as a hint to a more complex type of text reuse, since these portions are both a secondary witness of a homily originated in the earlier work of Psikta de Rav Kahana. Furthermore, the algorithm was an effective tool in determining the affinity of the Tanchuma recension represented in the manuscripts. Here we compared MS Parma to the print edition on the one hand and the Buber edition on the other. As expected, Parma manuscript shows much weaker correlation towards the print edition in the book of Genesis and to some extent in Exodus II, compared to its strong correlation with Tanchuma Buber. Rolfus has proven itself with smaller units as well. This is the first page of manuscript Geneva with its poor 80. It is quite common for a first page of a manuscript to appear worn out and obscure, hence providing with a mal transcribed HDR. Nonetheless, the GUI was able to identify it for what it is as a Tanchuma Vaikra. But in the first paragraph, not a single engram is marked out as Tanchuma. This is indeed an insertion of a passage from Midrash Agada, a medieval work, seen on the third result here. This result becomes more significant when the 80 was replaced by the corrected text of this page. To sum up the first examinations based on the HDR Tanchuma manuscripts, we concluded that A, Rofus is an effective tool for cataloging maltranscribed Hebrew manuscripts, including those processed through automatic reading. B, that given a relevant rare reference library, Rofus can identify the content of full manuscripts as well as noticing units to the paragraph level. And C, that due to its fuzziness factors, Rofus is not effective in distinguishing between small text variants, a task that fits better to other existing tools such as Dicta's, Dicta's Synopsis Builder. Now, for the next phase, we wanted to challenge Rofus with more complex materials and to test his ability to cope with anthological heavily altered text. Such a challenge was MS London 1389, an anthology of theology, ethics, and general Jewish wisdom arranged by themes. It is built chiefly of Talmud and Midrash passages combined with medieval commentary. This manuscript was known to Jewish scholars interested in the medieval commentary of Baalea Tosafot, such as Marmorstein and Orbach, but it was never prob probably published. Already in 1928, Marmorstein felt that the MS an anonymity is unreasonable. There is another manuscript in the, uh, in the British Museum, he wrote, which was composed by a scholar in England. Marmorstein believed the provenance of the MS was England, later disagreed by other scholars. Which is not only unpublished, but practically unknown. 
Is it too much to expect that such a work will be made known? It is time that almost 100 years later, his request will be answered. Manuscript London was produced during the 14th century and written in Ashkenazi semi-cursive script. The first sign of use, however, point to Italy. According to ownership and cell notes on the back of the codex, this work was part of the rich library owned by the prominent of San Miniato family located in Florence. They were the first Jewish family to gain permission to move into Florence in order to establish a moneylender business in town. On the second day of ER, 1490, the note on the last page declares, Mrs. Bionda, the widow of Rabbi Mordechai of San Miniato, sold this codex to his nephew, Rabbi Yitzchak. While still in Mordechai's hands, probably during the 70s of the 50th century, the famous censor Marquion has left his marks through the manuscript, adding his signature next to every deletion done by his rule. Marquion's signatures were found in other manuscripts extant from the family of San Miniato Library, among them the famous Florence manuscripts of the Talmud. During the last decade of the 16th century and the second decade of the 17th century, the Codex was censored again and again by the two most active Hebrew censors in medieval Italy, Domenico Yerushalmi in 1595 and Giovanni Domenico Caretto in 1619, both located in Mantova. During the 19th century, the manuscript reappears among the many inquisitions of the French Jewish scholar, book collector, collector and allegedly forger, Eliakim Carmoli, whose signature was found on the bounding pages. Following Carmoli's death in 1875, the codex was finally sold to the British Museum by the bookseller Fischel Hirsch, who, was, who took an active role in expanding the museum Hebrew manuscripts collection. The unknown work copied in manuscript London fits our purpose for, as an anthology arranged by subject, it naturally cites various early Jewish sources beginning in Tanik law through Talmud and Midrash and up to some medieval sources and commentary. Based chiefly on Agadic materials, which tend to be reused in later Midrashim, we expected to have abundance of parallels, quotations, and other text reuse types. Furthermore, the scribe had usually noted his references on the margins next, next to the cited source. These references are therefore a touchstone according to which Rufus can, results can be evaluated, particularly in cases where there are many parallels and it is not clear where the text is drawn from. Yet, as we found out when first results had come through, MS London poses greater challenges. Whereas high level of text we use is to be expected, we did not foresee the amount of adaptation these texts were went through. The sources are often heavily altered and rephrased, hence producing ambitious, ambiguous, uncertain re results. Furthermore, the anthology incorporates commentary notes often blended into the text. The lack of clear markers between Midrashic source and commentary adds further complication to the effort to identify original text passages. I'll present now some examples of these results in order to demonstrate these challenges and then suggest some further improvements needed as a consequence of these issues. We began the process by HDR in the manuscript through Escriptorium with satisfactory outcomes. The character error rate of 3.6% reflects the high error rate in marginalia transcription, while the main text HDR includes few errors. The results of the sources, source analysis itself, however, were of mixed quality. At first sight, they confirmed that the dominance of the Babylonian Talmud as the main source from which the manuscript draws its materials. In this chart, the Babylonian Talmud citations are patent blue, and even without going into details, the impression we get from the chart corresponds to the picture arises from the marginalia references. Yet, a closer examination had shown that the identification results were not as statistically significant as we received in the Tanhuma analysis. This sample page 
contains quotations of four sources. The painted text marks the line correctly identified by the algorithm. However, the only source explicitly identified in the text from Babli Evermot, third one, has not been identified by Rothfuss, probably due to its shortness. In the first source, some of the lines were false positives, error but caused by the fact that both completely different texts mention the same name, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai. This example demonstrates a good, though not great, identification rate. This second example demonstrates a more moderate success. The page has four references noting the text origins in green circles, and some commentary is blended in, in yellow circles. In two cases, the commentator's name are explicitly mentioned, the 12th century Spanish lexicography Hapirchon and the famous 11th century Rashi. A large portion of the page is based on Babli Brachot 18, which is not cited whole. Some parts are omitted and passages from other sources along with commentary are inserted in, into the discussion. This main unit was successfully recognized as demonstrated here in the GUI, despite all modification affecting the score. Here again, you can see it in the line by line algorithm marked by the painted lines. However, it identified the lexicographic commentary of the Pirchon in line six to seven as part of the Babli. Miss the first lines of the citation from Ta'anit in lines 10 to 12, and the short citation from Babli Sanhedrin on line eight was missed altogether. It thus seems that the brute force of the algorithm works well with extensive passages, but is liable to miss very short ones. The high level of adaptation had caused another type of deviation. In these cases, Rothfuss is wrong, even though it's right, or vice versa. In this example, the anthology cites a midrashic unit from Babli Brachot 10, and the scribe had mentioned it in the margins. Rothfuss had indeed identified Babli Brachot, but the score is only 9%, and it is not the first answer. The algorithm gave a much better score, 17%, to Yelkut Shimoni, which is itself an anthology and therefore clearly a secondary source. Rafus was wrong, this is not the original source from which the author had cited, but it is also right since the version brought in MS London shows higher linguistic resemblance toward the Yelkut version as opposed to the Babli. This is a significant find. It may say something about transmission patterns and about affinities between the two anthologies. Yet, for the purpose of mapping the early sources of the codex, these results create an unwanted noise. In summon, these examples demonstrate that various types of modification, additions, and abbreviation, translation into, of Aramic into Hebrew, commentary, and other natural transmitting alternations expose Rofu's limitations and decrease its efficiency in identification of text reuse. At last, I'd like to point out several improvements we plan to implement in order to overcome these challenges. Some of them we've already begun to carry out. First, we'd like to decrease amount of false positive by setting a threshold, threshold for n-grams value that will allow us to avoid very low scores. That, though may be valid results, too often they turn out to be false positives. Here, the correct positives were marked in blue. The values painted in mauve indicate high n-gram scores. A threshold would give no identification for all low scores, eliminating the noise of false positives next to, unfortunately, some correct ones. Then we'd like to implement a probability score that take into consideration both Engram score and data from previous line. We believe that the aggregated score might be more accurate than, than Engram score or preference toward earlier identifications each by itself. These two measures are entitled to improve result significance. 
The other components we'd like to upgrade is the index library. First, setting hierarchy between early and late sources is predicted to promote results of works more likely to be an original source rather than secondary text reuse, as Uwe explained. Second, allowing a selection of certain sub-libraries in the index shall enable a flexible search tailored to the specific feature of any manuscript and what works best for it. And of course, enriching and enlarging the index library with new sources as well as manuscript versions of existing works is an ongoing goal predicted to strengthen the accuracy of Rufus results. We are looking forward to initi initiating these upgrades and hopefully make Rufus adaptable to fits for various types of manuscripts and challenges. Thank you. Many thanks, Vare. Um, and uh, again, uh, please address questions in the chat and, and we will answer all questions after Marco Rufus uh, responds. So we, we were supposed to have now Hadar Miller uh, lecture. Uh, in, in the stead, I will, I will provide you with uh, a kind of an overview of, of our journey to text to use in, in the current project as well as in other projects. I will, uh, though I cannot present in detail the technical developments Hadar is already implementing, I will point out to some ideas uh, that uh, might solve some of the issues uh, that we have so far with uh, Rofus. Um, okay, so. Um, so few comments about text to use in the study of rabbinic and other corpora in, in, our, in the Elijah lab. Um, and what, what, I'm, what I would like to speak of is, is uh, first to refer, to refer to the text, to our turn towards uh, uh, text to use as an example for DH study and work experience. Uh, to tell the story of how we gradually drifted towards this direction, though this drifting is probably a very positive development. I would like to emphasize the tensions which you already uh, uh, sensed in Vered and Uri uh, lectures, the tensions between sufficient versus robust uh, application, and also the tension between uh, what I would say DH, digital humanities versus IS, information system validation, uh, which are not exactly the same processes. And then, and then to speak for a little bit about future fantasies. In, in between, I will present another project of text reviews we've done in the, la in, in, in the lab, as well as explain the directions I um, Hadar is, is, is uh, developing now. So, so first, uh, as you heard already from Vered and Uri, um, the journey towards text reuse began be, um, in, a, in, in the search to classify Geniza fragments. And it was an outcome of our transcription projects uh, when we realized that we cannot achieve um, very good or sufficient or, or excellent transcriptions, we thought, okay, but what we produce still can be uh, helpful for other tasks. For example, for identifying which books are represented in the Geniza fragments, or at least for classifying uh, the genre of the Geniza fragments. And in the hackathon that we had, oh, not in 2021, actually in 2019, uh, in the last two years, we didn't have a hackathon in the BSc program in Jewish in, in digital humanities in Haifa due to the COVID. And I really hope that we will have new hackathon uh, in the following years and because the hackathon is an amazing opportunity. Many of the projects and the employees and the grants uh, that are around 
uh, initiated in such hackathons. However, um, in this evening, in which we realized that um, Rufus' first um, design was uh, implemented, and we realized that it can uh, be helpful to a certain extent uh, on Geniza fragments, we also realized that text to use can be a hammer uh, that we can use on, on many, many other nails. Uh, mainly the understanding that the efficiency of text to use uh, in, in mapping full manuscripts, as you just see, is much stronger than coping with fragments. Um, also, uh, text to use efficiency in small tasks related to, to other projects. It, we use it for text alignment in Tikkun Sofrim. We intend to use it in other texts. Also, we realized that this, the process of, of annotating the text, the raw text, may, may gain a lot of benefit, benefit when we can actually uh, identify the content of the text and mapping relations. And, and, and uh, within a presentation that I will not uh, present here, um, it, all its elements, but uh, we designed, um, mainly Uri was working on it, we designed a model for a future library of the Tanhuma literature in which all the, the complicated relations between different uh, representations of this um, literature will be arranged in a RDF and CTS based um, data model. And, but the content will also be analyzed and identified the relations between different units, which you can see here on the screen, will be analyzed by Rufus or other text use tools. Um, and lastly, we realize that we can move from rabbinic text to other corpora. Um, so, um, and one project that was already done uh, dealt with Arabic medical literature. In a minute, I will speak about this project, but also we aspire and hope to move on to create something which will maybe even enable work with different Arabic dialects. Anyway, I want to tell you a little bit about the Arabic medical literature project, which was a very, very small project. But what is important in this project is actually its dynam dynamics. The project um, was born out of Rufus. Uh, we re um, and, and, it, and the model worked like that. We had a very small corpus of Geniza fragments of Arabic medical books, which are unidentified. Um, a simple transcriber, which was a kind of a very simple GUI that Dror Elovich created for us, as a lesson from Tikkun Sofrim, which has a very complicated uh, um, 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 interface, uh, was used on, on in one person only used it, and he, uh, transcribed the most rare lines from each fragment, and then they were checked against the reference library, which we actually took from another project in the lab, which is that of the caliphate, um, the Jewish communities in the early Islamic caliphate I mentioned in the opening lecture today. And then, inspired by Rufus, we operated text to use detection, which led to efficient, uh, to successes, namely to unknown uh, the unidentified Geniza fragments were identified by that. And what you see here is a very simple tailored solution with, with no um, technological innovation, but with, it's a product of a lab. It's a product of a group in which different people are working on different tasks and each one of them can contribute to a very simple um, building of a modular element that makes um, that, that make that produce efficiency thanks to that. So just this is just a comment about the dynamics of digital humanities and 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 okay. Now, um, what what was presented earlier by 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 Verde and Uri, he also sent us to something which is related to the experience of the humanities scholar when working with those tools when we are like dancing between the different Rufus output modes. 
between the line by line mapping and the GUI examination with the markering of relevant passages. And therefore we can define graph based visualization to examine and to explore ex hypo hypothesis. And going back from one to another, uh, it ended up with an experience in which we, we, we do find interesting phenomena. Now in this experience, the validation of the algorithm is actually me, namely the person who is a, a, an expert in the text who is saying, yes, thank you. The algorithm turned my attention to an important textual phenomena I wasn't aware of, and maybe better, no one was aware of. And in that sense, for the sake of the humanities, it is sufficient. However, uh, when we want to move on and to use those tools for a robust application that would enable us to provide highly probable identifications of every single line in every um, um, Hebrew manuscript out of the 12 million images of pages that soon will be available through Ktiv, then we need to, do, to, to, to work towards something which is more delicate than what Rufus is providing us now. And this will include pre-processing, I will not get into details, rule-based model in which we can define what we should expect from different types of text reuse patterns. For example, when I have um, two um, parallel, when I have two, two parallel homilies in two different rabbinic works, I should expect that they will have roughly um, X, X um, similar engram, X engrams, X similar engrams within 100 words. And when I have uh, halachic deliberations, I should expect that they will have uh, Y similar engrams in the size of V within 100 words and so forth. And finding out those relations might enable us to, ident uh, to identify different phenomena and to write a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, rule to, to search for, for all those implications. I will, I will move on because I want to spur some time for um, Marco's response. Um, so one of the tasks that um, Hadar is already tackling is related to the cases in which Vered presented earlier, in which we have um, many secondary uses of the, of, the, of the text, which provide us actually with false positives. We have the same text quoted in another work, but this is not the text that is really used here. Um, and, and then the question arises, how can we infer those secondary uses and, and identify which are more, which are primary uses, which are real, the real sources quoted. And what, and what Ada has noticed is that secondary uses usually have many uh, relations in between them and they actually create clusters. And within those clusters, only one uh, text is the real uh, uh, text reuse uh, source. And now you have to understand that, and, and this is how it looks already. There is a, an improved GUI that uh, following Rufus, but is doing some other elements that Adar is now developing, but also visualizations of the entire network of relations between uh, the, can, the, the, the examined candidate, all the results that we have, and the positives as well as negatives. Now you have to understand that for me, as the, as the humanist in the field, in, in, in that, I am very happy not only with that saying that these are positive reuses and that these are false, I am very happy with all those relations. I want to go down this graph and to explore and understand why these four uh, texts uh, were found out as related. And if, I, if searching for such a fixed statement like, Rabbi Yuda, the son of Simon, said so, okay? And clearly this text is quoted in dozens of places and it will give us so many wrong hits. 
But look at that. Um, the interrelation between the wrong hits is telling me a story that I have to explore what is this story. There is a cluster, there is a kind of clustering of sources that has this quotation in them. And, and you see what we create. This is the back and forth dynamic I was speaking of earlier, earlier today. The dynamics in which I'm asking one question, but the outcome might, might turn my attention towards other, maybe not less important, uh, insights that the text is is sharing with us. Okay, so where do we hope to go on from here? We hope to go towards robust cataloging of mal transcribed Hebrew manuscript, um, a dynamic library of Tanhuma literature based on the identification of, of relations, and also um, applying text reuse for improving HDR models as text reuse is providing us with the a way to find feedback to uh, and to retrain the models. Um, and, um, and finally, maybe uh, developing a triple app virtual research environment for text to use the three elements of this triple app will be the GUI interface, full manuscript line by line mapping, visualization. Just imagine that now everything we are doing uh, is, is based on still on actually work that Uri is doing. But imagine that all of this will be uh, structured within one framework, as in eTracer, uh, where you have helpful frameworks, we will hear. Um, that's the future. That this is where we are um, approaching. I know that I could not represent not the technical details of what Dar is doing now, uh, but I hope that this uh, in improv improv improvised uh, presentation gave you some ideas about where we are heading. And uh, with that, I can move on to Marco Buchler. Um, uh, clearly um, uh, one of the leading figures in the field of uh, text to use applications uh, for digital humanities. Uh, Marco is, is um, maybe I would say, the founder, if not uh, the, the spirit behind eTracer and eTrap and other services which are already available in, in, in the web uh, for text to use. And I think there's no one in the world which is suitable to give a response to our very initial efforts in the field of text to use uh, as Marco, please. Thank you, Moshi. Those were extremely kind uh, words. Um, uh, I feel very, very hard uh, to uh, give you here my response. If you look in digital humanities and the field of text analysis to different tasks, you have tasks like stylometry, where you take a text, plug them in a tool, and 30 minutes later, maximum, you have something out. All of this is uh, text is for sure, not about. Uh, all of you who, like Sine, <laughs> um, who uh, ever worked on textures know that modeling textures is very, very, very challenging. And I think this is what we all have seen from the three talks here today, that it's a lot about which parameters fits in which scenario best and uh, not the same setting that work here better uh, do not necessarily have to be the right and the best for in another scenario. And I think this was, this came uh, very clearly out. I have some very general remarks and some uh, uh, talk specific remarks <coughs> that I would now uh, give uh, feedback for. I think what uh, the general remark became very, very clear is that there's a need for identifying small textures. Identifying bigger chunks of reuse is rather simple, but uh, making a distinction, and this all became very clear from uh, Verit's talk, um, uh, uh, for smaller junks uh, is very, very challenging. Just to give you a number, in our experience in my lab, we figured out that, especially in antiquity, about 80% of the text reels focusing on in Greek and Latin have a size of two, three, or four words. And if you look at two, three, four words, and you have something like to be or not to be, a sequence of function words, while on the other hand, you have something like golden calf that alludes to the Bible, 
Yeah, uh, why is uh, both working? Yeah, um, uh, and it, uh, this makes identification of small chunks of reuse extremely challenging. So why is golden calf and I fear blue sky? Why is blue sky not alluding to nothing but golden calf uh, alludes to a Bible? So linguistically, they are the same, but from a textualist point of view, they have completely different effects on identifying an illusion versus being a false positive. <coughs> um, so um, one thing I can say is for the first talk of uh, Uri, if there's an interest in some speed improvements, we made some recent analyzers for how to speed this process up. This is literally finished a month ago. This is, I don't want to stretch this here too much in detail because this is extremely technical in the background and it's about bitmaps and things that might be in a humanities context, not the right uh, place to be. Uh, but at least I would like to have this announced uh, uh, here. Um, something that I also noted down is, please do make all the false positives you found available. Yeah, not just focus on the uh, uh, um, uh, positives you are interested in, the true positives, but all the please make the false positives available um, to uh, the researchers. And as soon as you have data collections, both with the positive findings and the negative findings you are not interested in, um, and you try to identify what is the difference, why do you like the one and the other ones not, you will figure out that modeling textures becomes a completely new challenge. Yeah, uh, uh, as with simple metrics as like counting words or engrams, um, you will see that this will be not the immediate response. So also for the community, please, please, please um, um, make the false positives available. And if there's a possible possibility, also explain briefly why uh, it's uh, uh, for you in false positive. I'm also, and I'm now jumping between my notes from the three talks, um, along to this line, all the consider um, uh, inter-rater scores. So um, when we uh, matched in our lab um, uh, critical editions so, or a text uses from critical editions to our outputs, we saw that um, our experts disagreed with what was written in the critical edition, not by the passage found, but by the interpretation. Is it a paraphrase? It is a quotation or what is it? And so I think we should not consider uh, a finding as something absolute, but uh, we should consider seriously that the, um, this kind of using the crowd, uh, using uh, the wisdom of the crowd, uh, will give us additional benefit on sharpening our idea on uh, why is something or why is something quoted and what is considered to be uh, relevant and uh, what not. Um, um, a general remark uh, over all the presentation is um, um, as you're working on Hebrew here, uh, please try uh, to consider um, text use on roots of words. Yeah, so in Germany, I'm very jealous on this ability because we don't have it. But uh, I think all the going way, way beyond uh, literal uh, translation or verbal translation uh, or um, a text to use, this will really, really be of benefit, I think, um, to identify uh, further reuses and maybe also to remove some false positives you are not interested in. In uh, Uri's talk, but this is maybe something that I ju just I missed, uh, it was not clear to me how the scoring came together. There were comparably low scores of 18 or 9%. Um, I think it's something like an overlap uh, or similarity, but um, I uh, um, uh, at least could not judge from scratch what this could mean. Also regarding Uri's talk, I think it was more in the outline, um, you also spoke about further improvements for using synonyms. I just encourage you to look also for further um, semantic relations. We figured out that uh, the usage of synonyms is at the same level as those of the co-hyponyms. Co-hyponyms are, for example, cat and dog. They are just the animals that you are at home to say that have the same hyponym. And this simply comes with the fact that um, 
if you look at historical data, it's very difficult to find two concepts that are stable in the semantic relation to each other over a long, long time. So co-hyponyms in historical texts, something let's say similar, even if the meanings of the words might change over the centuries, is from my experience uh, um, often uh, um, better than just looking on synonyms. Um, this may be for Yuri's talk. Um, on the second talk, um, I got this uh, trick I had a few uh, years ago. Um, um, and it's a positive one that I think we need for text to use. And this, I just kind of, I got a kind of a deja vu um, uh, uh, analysis on how good can our text to use algorithms really perform on different degrees of noise. With noise, I mean here character error rates. Yeah, so if you have different types of character annotated text, you have low character arrays, higher character error rates, and at which scale uh, text source algorithms can still perform, and then they simply suck and don't do anything anymore. I think this would be good to see, also get an understanding of where for Hebrew, um, uh, there's this kind of a threshold where you can still accept uh, the output and where it's simply too noisy and text reuse can't help you uh, with anything anymore. Um, as there were no slide numbers, it's, it was very difficult to now align to the um, um, uh, 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 to the right context. But this manuscript Palma three one two two, I very very much in favor with this example. I was or when I got the slides in advance, I was really in love with this uh, part, and I just can encourage you. Please publish, please publish, please publish. Um, uh, the distinguishing, uh, this was in the end of the talk of small text reuses. That's a true challenge. Uh, this is how I introduced uh, the section that um, on my response. And um, I think there's no universal uh, answer on this question right now. The smaller the reuse, the more difficult it is uh, to identify what is noise and what is uh, something positive you want to have. Um, regarding the probability score, um, we made experiments on this. Um, I was not that satisfied from this. Um, this is simply by the fact that uh, with words, you have a power law distribution. And um, we published a uh, course by the Zipf's law. This means that 50%, around about 50% of the words in a corpus, independent from size, occur only once, about 16% occur twice, about 8% occur three times. And you sum all of this up, we define in our lab the 90-10 rule. Uh, this means that more than 90% of the words occur 10 times and less. And um, though um, with other words, uh, you have for most of the, for the majority of the words, you have so little probability that if you become, begin to work with probabilities, everything will be a statistical surprise uh, if you would just consider two or three words. So this was in the end our result. And um, um, uh, this may be- Which is uh, actually taken on board by Hadar actually. Okay. <coughs> and regarding the third talk, um, I, I made three, uh, as noted three things. Two already I mentioned, please annotate all the in your RDF graph the false positives. You can always uh, uh, ignore them when you want to display results. But uh, in the beginning, you had this. Um... Un unmute yourself. You're, somehow you were muted. I don't know why I was now muted. Uh, probably I talked too long. Um, so in the um, on slide four of your presentation uh, on um, what was this title? Linking paragraphs RDF. I just can encourage you all to consider the to annotate the false positives and to really track them through the application. For proper application, you can always uh, ignore them. Uh, but uh, I think the false positives are for research purposes. The best part to have. Um, I also mentioned the iterator scores and the text series inference, I just noted down, uh, I'm in love with this. I really uh, fancy this idea. And um, uh, that's, this is what I can say. Let me check if I, yeah. Um, 
I have one little uh, last note. I put this on the back on my on one of the sheets, <coughs> just to uh, be aware of that. I want to say this as, as a last thing. Um, um, I think it's always important also to make expectation management. When you compare uh, textures with critical editions, we figured out, we started with 1.7 million euro uh, in 2015. And we, in several experiments, we experienced every time the same, maybe Latin, maybe Greek, maybe Coptic, that the new findings were extremely little. These new findings, I really mean here, uh, findings that were not in the critical editions or in these indexes of uh, text to use of the well-studied authors. It was always something like less than 10. Often this, uh, um, um, uh, what was the Latin author? I can't remember. Um, Greta Francini made this work, it were two or three. Yeah, but the two or three, this were then really, really uh, uh, re important. Um, so with all this quantitative methods, uh, it looks like a bit disappointing to in the end find very little really new findings that are relevant and no false positives. But uh, the more important this very few findings are. And I guess with Hebrew, uh, it might be the same uh, effects here. That's me. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, it will be difficult to address uh, so many notes, and we will also be very recorded, and we will take them on board. Uh, are there any further um, questions from the crowd, or who you heard want to, re to respond to one of uh, Marco's many comments? Just one regarding this. What? Just one regarding the. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Regarding the scores, they're all um, uh, relative. So, what you see, the the, uh, the score is actually just the ratio between the number of engrams found uh, to match the the document uh, and the number of engrams in the input text, and they're simply. Uh, sorted uh, so that the best one is the, the, the document that resulted in the highest number of engrams that matched it. Uh, so there's, it's really a simple uh, scoring for now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not looking into the, the quality of the, of the can, result. If you want, I can send you some alternative models. Uh, and this is a standard uh, problem. Um, um, as the size is one thing, but if you have a long, long document with only, with maybe 19 engrams shared, but uh, let's say uh, 5,000 or so engrams, then you have an extremely low score. Yeah, uh, but nevertheless, this ratio would be, uh, this is, texture would be super, super significant. Uh, I think it's difficult without a whiteboard here to explain, but if you want, I can send you some other metrics that are also super simple to implement but might be here or of help to consider both the overlap, but also the size of the overlap at the same time. Right. And how they cluster in the geographical uh, uh, arrangement of the, of these engrams. Yeah. Great, that, that will be great. Thank you. Any further questions? So I shall thank, uh, uh, there's one question in the chat, but we are one minute uh, toward the end. So we, we shall conclude the session now and people, as we've done in formal breaks, people may chat uh, during the break. The Zoom is still open. And we will, uh, uh, many thanks to Vered, to Marco, to Uri, um, and we will, uh, uh, gather here again at uh, at seven thirty for the next session, which is analysis of metadata response methods and findings. Uh, so see you see you soon.